something of that proposition that we used to calculate the connection coefficients last time. But this is for I, lo our lower I, J, K, upper L. It's equal to the partial derivative with respect to X, I of gamma lower J, K upper L minus the partial derivative with respect to X, J of gamma um, lower IK upper L. There is a conservation of indices here. The L is always up. Plus the sum over S from 1 to N of gamma JK upper S gamma. It's got to be an upper L. It's got to be there somewhere. Lower IS minus gamma IK upper S gamma. <coughs> Don't know why it took Einstein so long to figure out the math of this. JS upper L parentheses. It's so much worse than what your book shows you, by the way. It did take Einstein a couple of, I mean, special relativity came to Einstein relatively quickly, more or less in the period, period of his adolescence, 1905. He found it in like other significant results. It took about 10 years for him to grapple with the mathematics of general relativity, which is this math, which was not widely known and, and or as nicely presented as is in this book, by the way. You got to understand, though, that these are the these are the building blocks for Einstein's general relativity. Um, but anyway, maybe next semester. Um, <clears throat> so that that yeah. So it's but you remember how the gammas were built? They're derivatives of the metric, right? They're ugly combinations of the derivatives of the metric. So this is like second derivatives of the metric. So the curvature has to do with the second derivatives of the metric. If the metric is non-constant, then this might be non-zero. And then this is a rank 4 tensor. I'm sorry, well, type, I should say type 0, 4 tensor. And you can play the usual games with raising and lowering indices. So from this, you build what's called the, um, it, it's got, by the way, it's, it's nice. It's got all kinds of symmetries. They're described in proposition 5.555 and 5 point, corollary 5.56 and 5 point, I mean, he's got pages simplifying this. He, he actually gives you the token calculation um, for, for that, you know, for this, uh, for the pullback metric of the hyperboloid, I mean, excuse me, the paraboloid, after about a, yeah, it's not too long. He calculates that our, he, he, he does show that um, for this thing, it works out that uh, our one, two, one, two, <laughs> Sorry. Our 1, 2, 1, 2 works out to minus 4 over um, 1 plus, and he's got a lot of the details in there if you want to follow along. But I don't think I actually assigned you guys any calculations of cur did I? I can't remember. I don't think I did. I might have. I probably did. But um, you might notice, oh, here it is, example 5.5.10 on page 242. Here he actually lists the Christoffel symbols for the Poincaré metric one of your other homework problems to calculate them. It's kind of nice. You know what you're looking for, right? He doesn't show how to do it there, but he, he says, uh, as in exercise 5.9. Well, that's not entirely honest. They're not in exercise 5.9, so it's very nice that he wrote them here. Just saying. A little shout out for you. Now, from this as little monster of multilinear algebra, this type 0, 4 tensor, you can build um, sectional curvature. And sectional curvature, um, k sigma, which is kxy, well, that will be r of x, y, y, x, divided by g of x, x, g, y, y, minus gxy squared. What this is, um, 
what this is, guys, so-called sectional curvature, is it's, it's basically the curvature um, of your space looking at just the plane. So X and Y are a basis for sigma. Sigma is actually a plane. You can think about a plane field. You can think about this in R3. What's a plane field? It's like a, it's an assignment of subspaces. So like a plane field could be a stack of horizontal spaces like the xy plane, z equals 1, z equals 2, z equals 3, an assignment of a plane to each, each point in space, that would be a plane field. So like the space? Like the what? The, uh, spaces. Yeah, like the coset spaces are essentially, I mean, we're kind of playing that game there. And um, so x and y would be a, in, in the you know, span, the sigma plane field. And that has something to do with the curvature with respect to a subset of your space, all right? This is also a useful and interesting idea. And um, he has proposition, he mentioned some propositions about it, like, uh, it does, yeah, okay, great. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter which, his theorem is really, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's just kind of funny. He's like, if it doesn't matter if you, whatever basis you pick for sigma, if you choose a different basis for sigma, it's, it's equal, it's like the same, because a different basis, um, it ends up both involving the determinant of the transformation between the basis, because of the symmetries of the tensor, it pulls out the determinant upstairs, and you pull out a determinant downstairs when you change the basis. <clears throat> anyway, whatever, I mean, it's fine. Not really my point today. In the two-dimensional case, though, this in the two-dimensional case, that actually reduces to the Gaussian curvature. The Gaussian curvature is actually the determinant of the shape map. Um, so we usually use K for Gaussian curvature. And I can tell you this, it's, it's, it's equal to the determinant of the shape map. And I don't remember if the shape map is exactly this, but it's related to this. Okay, so in the context of a two-dimensional two -dimensional case, this monstrosity, this rank, this type 4, 0, zero 4 tensor reduces to the classical Gaussian curvature in this, in this way. <coughs> you can also talk about the Ricci, curv the Ricci, um, Ricci curvature. The Ricci curvature is a type is a type 2 tensor that you get from contracting a pair of the indices out. And you can also talk about the Ricci scalar. The Ricci scalar is formed from contracting two pairs of this tensor, so you get a scalar. These are all geometrically interesting quantities. The wild tensor, which is what general relativity is built from, is some kind of linear combination of these things and the metric. That actually is what physically is interesting. And that brings us to isometries, which is what I'll talk about Friday. Isometries are very interesting. Now, there's one last thing, though, because it answers your question. And um, one last thing, uh, answer to your question, um, you know, what, um, <coughs> excuse me. You know, what, how, do you, um, how do you quantify, when is it that parallel transport around a loop doesn't bring you back where you started? Like, what governs that? How can you expect that to happen or not happen, right? It has to do with the curvature. And um, let me write down this theorem for you. There's more, I should say, actually, in that regard. Um, let's see if I can't find that pesky theorem in here. I, I wanted to write it down for you guys. So the reason that it doesn't violate the B parallel along the loop, because technically those are at different times, so you can't compare its angle with itself. Then... Right. Okay. Yeah, I remember it's, with, it's always with respect to a parameterized curve. And when you get back to where you started, you're not where you started. Because time has passed, very good. That's ex 
Right, no, that's, you can't. Um, Yeah, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is how it's stated, um, and it's, well, I'll just, I'll state it for you guys. This is theorem 8.9, and um, this is manifolds, tensors, and forms by Paul Rentlin. And it's really not a good reference <laughs> for this theorem I'm saying because basically he gives the easy half of the theorem and then he says, and the other part is a deep theorem. <laughs> so this isn't really the greatest reference for this either, but it's what I could find at the moment. Um, and uh, by Paul Rentlin. Fantastic book, by the way. And here's how he writes it. H tilde nabla semicolon P is trivial. All right. I.e., it consists only of the identity element if and only if the curvature vanishes everywhere. Now, you might ask what this H tilde is. That's the holonomy group. So you can look at the angle. Um, well, let me see here. I just. Um, the holonomy group, the holonomy, oh, good grief, holonomy group of nabla based at P. So, or, oh, this is actually the restricted holonomy group. It's the holonomy group of all contractible loops at P. So you look at the, the loops at P, which look at, you know, you take your, take your manifold, you take your point P, and you look at the loops, which are contractible. I mean, if there's a hole in the manifold over here, what you're not allowed to do is this. All right? It's no bueno. But the contractible loops, the ones that can be smoothly deformed to a point, and then it's in the holonomy group if it is, I believe it's just the angle between vectors that are parallel transported around the loop with respect to the connection nabla. And this theorem says kind of exactly what you want. If the cur so the curvature is, when there is curvature, the transport does something funny. Different angles, yeah. And that can be made precise for something like a sphere with respect to the usual connection. You can actually, there's this nice interplay between the angle of uh, parallel transported vectors around a loop and the solid angle, which is subtended by the loop. There's a direct proportionality there. This is actually used in geometric optics in connection with Berry's phase, um, which has to do with the adiabatic uh, changing of a parameter in a quantum system. As it, you take this parameter in the quantum system and you, and you let it slowly change around some loop and parameter space, when it gets back, the, the phase that you had at the start doesn't have to be the phase that you started at the end, and that phase is called Berry's phase, and it's directly tied to the topological structure of the uh, underlying parameter space. But anyway, but that, to understand that properly, you have to understand parallel transport. But that's where I first learned of some of these things. But it's not really in your book, which I think is a shame because he's got this like, beautiful masterwork on like all the symmetry properties of curvature, but he doesn't say the most interesting things about it, which is that it has this connection with parallel transport. The 
the harder things is part of what's called the Ambrose Singer theorem. <coughs> and um, there are other things you can say, like if the curvature is zero, that means essentially that you're in Euclidean space. In a technical sense, you can make this precise. Maybe up next is isometries, where that will give us a much better, the isometry section will be very helpful because it's going to take away some of the weirdness and add some more, take away in the sense that it will help make more precise why it is we can look at the plane with weird geometry, like what's actually going on there. What do we, what's the idea? I, I think of it this way, these plane, the plane with these weird metrics, these are just toy models for the real space. In my view, the real space is the paraboloid. I mean, the paraboloid's the real thing, and this plane with weird metric, it's just a, it's a toy model of that. <coughs> and I seem to have started to cough, so I will stop now. Thanks, guys. Thanks. <clears throat>